the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, which I'd like to talk about a little bit, which we've been covering extensively on Who, What, Why. And she said, and, you know, they invited me on to talk about the Boston Marathon bombing. I assumed they had read my stuff. Well, I guess she hadn't because she said, I am, don't know about you, but I am wearing my Boston Strong T-shirt. And she, I, maybe she asked me if I was, and I said, listen, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I am just not into the propaganda and the myth-making stuff. I'm here to talk about what really happened in Boston and what it means about uh, the way that uh, they were able to uh, basically declare martial law and force everyone to stay in their homes. This had never been done before in this country, uh, that almost nobody spoke about it or asked about it or questioned it, not the media, and not most institutions either, not all those great uh, institutions of higher learning in the, in the Boston area. Those should have been at, at the forefront of raising questions. They're full of constitutional Constitutional law professors and so on. Nobody really said anything. And then um, almost immediately we heard that uh, they'd solved this. Did you notice that? They always solve everything really fast. I mean, they do. They solve everything really, really fast. It's never like Columbo or Agatha Christie. They get it in a second. And so I was thinking, boy, that FBI is really good. I mean, they're so good. And then I thought, you know, when I was working on Family of Secrets and I discovered that George H.W. Bush couldn't remember where he was on the day that John F. Kennedy, when, when John F. Kennedy was shot, we could talk about that later if you want, or you could just read the chapters in the book about him and, and the Kennedy assassination. But um, I became interested in, in the Kennedy assassination, and uh, I was struck by uh, uh, that, that the FBI was so incompetent that they, you know, they, they, you know, they had Lee Henry Oswald, they had you know, Harvey Lee Oswald, you know, they couldn't find the files. And I thought either they're incredibly incompetent or they're doing that deliberately or some combination of the two, both and any combination, all pretty bad. Uh, but guess what? Here we are 50 years later, and they're doing the exact same stuff. And um, we have an article on who, why, why, I hope you'll take a look at about the, um, uh, the report that just came out from the inspectors general of all these uh, different alphabet agencies where they are, you know, deliberately released it at the time of the first anniversary of the bombing. And it's the most astonishing document because if you read it very quickly, it's kind of boring and hard to fathom. It'd be sort of get a sense that they say, well, you know, they didn't do everything they could, but they did something. And there were some things that we would do differently, and that's the end of it. That's, by the way, that's what all reports say. You could just use the same report, you know, year in and year out because it always says the same thing. Um, and so I thought... Let me take a closer look at this. And then I realized that what these inspectors general were basically saying was their hands were tied. They couldn't really dig in. Uh, they him, themselves had been obstructed by these agencies. Uh, they, they had to black out or redact a whole section, uh, the most interesting and important section, which had to do with uh, what relationship, if any, might have existed between the U.S. government and the alleged bombers themselves several years prior to the bombing. Well, you would think... People would be interested. The media was not interested in this. Well, nobody seemed interested in that. Well, yeah, they knew them, but they didn't know them that well. I mean, you know, hello. I mean, it's just incredible. I, it, you know, they, they got, they'll, they'll lock a, a young black kid up for, you know, allegedly once looking at a joint, you know, and, and yet uh, here you've got, you know, it, the, the, the fire is awfully thick, uh, and not just smoke, but the fire is right there. And they say, yeah, well, and so I was looking at this, and I saw that this one FBI agent who had been interacting with the, with the Tsarnaev family, I particularly love this story because when they wrote about what he did, here's what he did. They, the Russians said, we've been, we have some information about the, these, the, this kid and his family, and we think that he's involved with some sort of terrorist activities, and you know, we urge you to take a look at him. Now, I mean, that's pretty much all the U.S. government seems to be in business this, these days is homeland security. So you would assume, well, they jump right on it. Well, and, and I was thinking, well, what would I do if somebody tipped me off that there was a potential terrorist in our midst? Um, so let's, let's, let me ask you quickly, what would you do if you got a report that there was a potential terrorist in your midst? What would you do? You'd investigate him. Okay. And how would you do that? Hey, by the way, there's probably one of you who does, but that's okay. Because <laughs> they always like to come to these things for enlightenment purposes. Uh, sorry? 
Okay, okay. See, now, look, look how intelligent this man is. So he's already qualified to be the director of the, of the FBI because none of them thought of that. So what they did instead, they didn't put him under surveillance. You know what they went? They went to talk to him and they said, are you a terrorist? <laughs> I kid you not, you have to read this, you know? And then they went to their neighbors and they said, is your neighbor a terrorist? And they were like, no, nah, I don't think so. Girlfriend, no, nah, not that I know of. Okay, clean bill of health. I swear, this is what happened. And, and then, uh, I think the Russians indicated that, you know, he was going to maybe go to Russia or Chechnya and so forth. And he goes. And uh, when he goes, they, there are normal... Uh, flags that are supposed to be raised, and I know because they harassed me at the airport, you know, and so they did nothing to him, and when he was coming back through, somehow the the border people who was, were monitoring, who knew a little bit about him, the flag was taken down, in other words, he was supposed to sail through, and this is very, very important because 9-11 was almost the exact same thing. All those guys were given those visas and stuff. And, and you know, Michael Springman, the, um, the U.S. consul, was objecting over the years to all of these guys. Who were, and he was, he was saying, I don't, you know, they're lying and they want visas. And I can tell that this is not, uh, not kosher, a funny term to use in Saudi Arabia. But anyway, uh, and, and, and they, uh, higher ups just ordered him to admit all these people. Uh, and that's how we got them all, you know, in the U.S. Uh, training to fly planes. I'm Mike Springman. Um, some 15 years ago now, I was chief of the visa section at the CIA's consulate at Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, people were being brought there from all over the Middle East uh, for visas to come to the United States. And I was told they were terrorists that were recruited to come to the U.S. for training and shipped back to Afghanistan for fighting the Soviet soldiers. I thought that, you know, this was really strange, but I couldn't explain it. And then when Trento and these other people started talking to me, and I said, well, this explains the whole thing. The reason why there was this pressure, the reason why these guys who were not businessmen, who were not educated, who were essentially low-level clerk type people, uh, supermarket checkers, uh, you know, guys who worked in an auto parts store, why visas were being demanded for them. and. You know, they, they, the, when I put the pieces together from my three contacts, it was people who were being here, who were brought here, who were recruited by the CIA and this asset, Osama bin Laden, to come to the United States for training as terrorists and to return them to Afghanistan to fight with the Soviet soldiers there and kill them. And so it's a very similar thing again that they, they let these guys in. Now you say, well, what could possibly be going on here? And it seems to me, after years of studying this stuff, that really, here's how it works. How does the FBI have such an incredible track record? How is it that they're always able to nail somebody? Anybody want to take a guess? They set them up. Okay. Something like that. Basically, what you do, you know, they remember the motto, the FBI always gets its man. And then it occurred to me, they always get their man because it's their man. <laughs> They know these guys, you know, they're in cahoots with them. They're going out for beers with them. And so it's a great system, you know, but it's, it's a kind of corruption. And it's just like, you know, you go to have your, your, you take your car to the mechanic and, you know, it's a racket, right? They flip something, they tell you, oh, you need this and you need that and so on. And it's often not true. Well, it's not just car mechanics. And there are many honest car mechanics and perhaps more higher percentage of car mechanics than people in one of these agencies, you know. But, but it's easy to kind of dump on them, you know, because they, they don't have the same kind of uh, lobbying power. Uh, but but uh, if you look at the FBI, they, they do this stuff all the time and they get away with it all the time. And to get a sense of why that is, you have to take a look at, let's say, Diane and Feinstein recently complaining that the CIA was uh, going into the, the senator's computers. Um, uh, uh, you know, other people telling uh, either publicly or privately uh, that they've been threatened. I remember one uh, U.S. senator once said to me, Russ, wh what do you think is the biggest industry in Washington? And I said, well, is he government? And then maybe lobbying? And he goes, he said, maybe, but I would say the most powerful industry in Washington is sexual blackmail. 
because we live in this kind of fantasy of perfection that everybody is, you know, happy with the 10 kids they have and that their marriage is fantastic and they go to church uh, regularly and so forth. And, and so there's nobody who's, you know, a, a kind of a flawed human being as in terms of the way that they have to sort of campaign and present themselves. Uh, and so it, it creates an impossible situation. There are how many people still uh, in high levels of politics who are uh, closeted, can't talk about their sexual orientation. Uh, and it's a real problem. And so they're all sort of trapped. And as you know, if you've ever read any books about J. Edgar Hoover, he was very much in the blackmail business, especially since he was able to stay in the closet, uh, or, uh, you know, dress up in women's clothes all those years and then harass uh, gay liberation people. So very interesting situations. And this, this gets me back to the importance of what we're trying to do with Who, What, Why, which is to be honest. You know, it's, we, we don't consider ourselves liberal or left or right or conservative or libertarian or anything. We feel that our job is to figure out what happened, what's happening, and report it. And believe it or not, there are a lot of things you can do in journalism uh, that involve objectivity. You know, either there are three people sitting in those chairs or there aren't. You know, either there's a guy running a camera or two guys running a camera or they're not. Now, somebody could say, well, I, there's only one guy running a camera because I don't see anybody at the other camera. I would say, well, he's just a little... he's you know, kneeling down or something. So, you know, these are things that can be factually resolved. And so, you know, drones, do they kill the...